broadcast of Innovation Summit, recorded on January 29, 2014 in Juneau, Alaska, is made possible by the Juneau Economic Development Council and 360 North. Thank you, everybody. These, uh, the reason for giving you a break was so that we could fill up the front tables, <laughs> which wasn't, uh, here they come, all coming to the front tables. While you guys are, uh, while you're coming in, you, this agenda, when I was highlighting the, what we have over the next few days, uh, I didn't try to mention everything that we have going on, but there's something exciting that uh, was one of our most uh, enjoyed sessions last year, and that's our Innovators in Alaska panel. And this year, it's going to happen tomorrow morning. Uh, we have a, a fantastic edition. Not only are we looking at innovators in business, but we're also going to be looking at a few innovators in government that have done things to strengthen the private sector. But our innovators in, uh, in, in private sector panel is, uh, is very special this year, and you're gonna learn a lot more about it tomorrow, but I just wanna give you a, a teaser. We had a, uh, a Southeast wide uh, business planning competition this year supported by two of our partners, Hani and the Nature Conservancy, and JDC and others played supporting roles. And from that, 63 businesses applied to with their innovative ideas. And, and from those, 12 were identified, and those 12 are competing for um, two awards that will be announced tomorrow evening. But we're gonna hear from several of those uh, businesses tomorrow morning talking about their ideas that they have for operating real businesses or expanding real businesses here in our region. So that's just a, uh, a nudge that as exciting as it's gonna be tonight, go get to bed early so that you don't miss anything in the morning. You seem settled down, no success on these tables up here at all. Russell? <laughs> you want to know? So with that, let's, uh, let's begin our next, uh, our, our, the rest of our afternoon. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Commissioner Bell. Soon as the com it, Susan Bell is the Commissioner of the Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development, where she oversees 12 agencies. The department works to strengthen Alaska's economy and communities by reducing the cost of energy, developing infrastructure needed to get resources to market, promoting Alaska's industries, and improving the business climate. Susan serves on the board of directors of the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, Alaska Energy Authority, the Alaska Railroad Corporation, the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, and as state co-chair of the Denali Commission. And she's also a big sister in our community. She's an amazing woman that does a lot. Uh, Susan worked closely with Alaska community leaders, residents, ANCSA corporations, nonprofits, tribal entities, and state and federal agencies in her prior roles as a McDowell Group Principal, Gold Belt Vice President, and Juno Convention and Visitor Bureau CEO. Born in Nome, Susan has been a Southeast Alaska resident since 1987. Please join me in welcoming uh, Commissioner Bell. Well, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. I have a lot of hometowns in Southeast, including Juno, Haines, Skagway, and Ketchikan. When, when Brian asked me if I would um, be part of the agenda. I was particularly excited to, um, to have the opportunity to introduce Thor first with ASME, the Division of Economic Development, and a number of other programs in the Department of Commerce. We do much to support and work with our uh, largest private sector employer, Alaska Seafood. But I also had a chance to meet him personally, visit the, the um, Iceland Ocean Cluster House when I was in Iceland last year in May, which was immediately preceding the inaugural flights of Iceland Air. So. Um, one, that was a real privilege, um, and I know we're all going to be very interested in learning what he has to share in the follow-up discussions, and I know many of you um, uh, had a chance to sit in the processor discussion this morning, so again, we're just really lucky to have Thor, who, when he says his name, you will hear many more musical syllables than I am <laughs> able to do. Um, also, Brian generously gave me a few minutes to talk about the Department of Commerce, and there's a number of commerce representatives here. Again, we have 12 agencies. If you guys can just raise your hand just so the people around you know you're, you're part of the family. We have over 500 employees, 12 agencies, um, and I'm really proud that both ADA, ADA representatives here, and ASME are part of the sponsors of this event. So, um, again, the the challenge is the restraint with 12 agencies and a lot of tremendous work that we do for the uh, for Alaskans. I'm going to make sure my, my slides pop up here. 
um, a lot of a lot of work we do. We're very focused across the department in developing our energy re resources, reducing the cost of energy. I'm going to highlight a few things in the in our energy work, in our infrastructure work. We also have a number of marketing programs. I think it's so important that we work to develop market awareness, generate demand for Alaska goods and services. Uh, today, I'm going to highlight ASME very briefly. We have many, many more uh, programs in the department, including the tourism marketing program, minerals development. We've got staff down in Vancouver right now at Roundup. We'll be heading to Toronto for PDAC soon. Forest products, one of the things, we've got a team here who helped develop the Made in Alaska home. We took that to several home shows this last year. More than 25 suppliers from Alaska, like our own very our very own in this region, um, Icy Straight Lumber from Huna. We're showcasing what we do produce in Alaska to consumers, to retailers, to the Home Building Association, and I know our team is working hard on, on building that as we go forward. Again, we've got many, many marketing programs from film, made in Alaska. We partner with private sector, we partner with other agencies, and we're very focused, especially under Governor Parnell, on the business climate. What can we do to keep things stable, keep taxes and fees predictable and low? What can we do to be responsive? So again, as I said, the, the challenge is restraint. Let me move quickly into my, my comments. Um, our mission as the Department of Commerce is to promote a healthy economy, strong communities, and protect consumers. We're very proactive about that, very engaged with the private sector, very engaged with communities. I'm going to touch on a couple of things that I think are really foundational, though, when we're talking about economic development. And later this evening, for those of you who will be here for the dinner panel, I really look forward to the comments from Mary Jo Waits, a former Juno resident, a former Division of Community and Regional Affairs um, employee, because I think is, it will be very interesting to hear her experience and what she has to share about the role of government. What, one of the things we really see, and I keep coming back to these foundational pieces, is work to develop our energy resources, our tra transportation infrastructure, business climate, and marketing. It's been mentioned in this last panel. It'll probably be mentioned again as we continue the next couple of days. Right now, oil pays for 90% of our general fund. I want to compliment the legislature for the work last year to make Alaska more competitive, but it's also really important that we work to diversify our economy. But again, we're working to be sure that Alaska is competitive globally with our oil. We've seen $4.5 billion of announcements in new investments, and I, I think that's important for us, even in this region, um, to be aware of. Also, looking at our, our uh, oil and gas resources, Alaska, we've seen a number of uh, announcements in the last week or so leading up to session in the governor's state of the state remarks. Alaska is poised to develop a gas line in a way that we've never seen this kind of alignment before. Alignment between the major producers, alignment, alignment with state agencies. We know we have a tremendous resource, it, um, more than 35 trillion cubic feet of North Slope gas. So again, um, it's very exciting for employment opportunities, for future revenue opportunities, and again, fundamentally, the cost of living and doing business in Alaska can be reduced. Our newest agency of our family of 12 is the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation. And um, I have the privilege of serving on this board. Um, their work is continuing. They were um, a subsidiary of the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation. And this is very aggressive work to develop an in-state gas line. And so for the next year or so, we're going to try to explore this major Alaska, Nat uh, Alaska natural gas line. But I think it's really important that we continue our work on the in-state line. Uh, the governor has called it our energy ace in the hole, but also really importantly, the powers that were granted to the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation and much of the work that they're doing right now, the data, the research, the alignment, will be transferable if Alaska is able to succeed in getting an equity stake in, in the major gas line in the future. This slide, Again, just touches on a few highlights. As we think about how we develop our infrastructure to develop our resources, get them to market, we have a really critical role when you think of the ports, the road, the railroads, the airports, and again, that the infrastructure. The Alaska Energy Authority has an important role as we look at our renewable energy resources. Um, here in Southeast, there's been a number of projects with small hydro around the state. We've seen biomass, geothermal, um, some solar, uh, wind projects. Um, also a major project is the Susitna Watana Hydroelectric Project. 
we're in the, uh, the middle of the um, FERC licensing process. And some of you may be aware that the legislature set a goal that 50% of our electrical generation would be from renewable resources by 2025. We're currently at about a quarter of that, or, or not a quarter of the goal, about a quarter. And Susitna and Watana would bring us to that goal. But again, it's, it's so important that we think about um, how we use the resources that we're so blessed with. Also, the Alaska Energy Authority and ADA have been working together on the Interior Energy Project. This would be in the near term, by late 2015, bringing nat natural gas into Fairbanks by truck. Um, we'd have a liquefaction facility on the, on the slope, a regasification facility in the interior. And this is really important because it helps then build out the distribution system in the interior so that later in this decade, when we see a gas line developed, will be ready and it'll be, um, it'll be, there'll be consumers that are ready to hook up to that. So again, lots of major infrastructure projects just north of us. Um, we're working with the Canadian mines in, um, and are poised to, ex to expand this gateway ore terminal to our south in Ketchikan. The shipyard has had a tremendous expansion, more than $70 million um, building the, um, it's, it's what you see in this top picture. For those of you who haven't been in Ketchikan, there's a whole new skyscraper there. But building the fabrication shop um, was, is, was critical to um, the Arctic Prowler tying into the fishing industry. That's a freezer longliner. The dedication was this last fall. Um, it was really significant. It was the largest commercial fishing vessel built in Alaska. And it was built right in Ketchikan. It was a major accomplishment for Ketchikan, for the shipyard, and for Alaska. And we're poised to build the next generation of Alaska Marine Highway vessels. This week, we'll see the dedication of another ADA facility. It's the Camp Denali Readiness Center. ADA has the ability to create, um, in this instance, it's for the Coast Guard. Coast Guard, um, it's on J. Bear, the military base near Anchorage. Um, the Coast Guard can lease a facility. We have the ability to construct it, and it's a great partnership. Uh, the railroad, another, um, another aspect of the Department of Commerce, is expanding at the northern and southern terminus. Ada is working on the Ambler Road, which is up in the northwest Arctic. So again, just hitting some of the highlights, there's a lot that we're doing, even, even in the Department of Commerce, let alone all state agencies working together to build critical infrastructure. Let me turn my focus as I, I come back to my primary purpose, which is the introduction, um, turn my focus for a couple of moments to our largest private sector employer. Uh, as the seafood industry is supported through a number of state programs, first of all, I think it's important to recognize our management. The things I touched on here were a little more um, tied into the Department of Commerce, but I, I as I travel around the world, tell people, um, uh, how proud I am that sustainability of our seafood industry is right in Alaska's constitution. The governor says it's in our DNA. And we not only have a very robust management system, we have through ASME, a very strong marketing program, a number of financing tools, including the Division of Economic Development. There's a number of small business loan programs. Those of you who are in fishing communities or in the fishing industry are probably very familiar with them. We also work with the hatcheries throughout the state, and we have enhancement programs. Again, financing through the Division of Economic Development is one of those tools. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure, of course, needed to support the industry, docks, harbors, airports. Um, very, a big focus throughout our K through 12 and university system on the workforce needs of the industry and a number of incentives. This week, um, this week the legislature will be discussing a bill introduced by Representative Osterman that is focusing on the salmon product development tax credit. So again, just touching on some of the ways that the state is helping um, strengthen this industry. As I come to the end of my, my slides um, that are uh, bragging about the good work our department does. Let me just close with a slide that's specific to the Alaska Seafood, Seafood Marketing Institute, Institute. Again, a sponsor of this event. Um, they have the pleasure of promoting our delicious and wild seafood in 21 countries around the world. Um, I've, I've been with them at a couple of the major shows that we go to. The largest, uh, largest seafood show in North America is in Boston. The largest show in Europe is the European Seafood Exposition. And I want to make a connection with Iceland here. We have stood with, a, with our top heads of state, the president of Iceland, the governor, um, the governor Parnell, um, 
We've stood side by side at both of these events and talked about our commitment to wild seafood, our commitment to sustainability, and our, our work through the Responsible Fisheries Management Program, which is a sustainability certification. So again, we've partnered, we've partnered together, we promote together. There's also a number of other really fun events. Alaskans get a chance to, to uh, see some of this through the Great Alaska Seafood Cook-Off. Last year, the, the bottom photo, some of you may recognize, uh, we had a chance here in Juneau to host uh, Top Chef. That was the, sort of the worst kept secret. But uh, anyway, we knew they were here. They just didn't want people to know who the winners were. And we, we had the pleasure of watching Juno be showcased, and, our, and, and that was really fun. Um, and again, ASME has many, many programs. But now let me switch gears and turn the stage over to... Uh, to Thor, again, I'm going to ask him to say his name, and it's really lovely, and it has more syllables when he says it. Um, he, he joins us from Iceland. We're going to hear more about the Ocean Cluster, which was established in 2011. Um, he, it, he has a PhD in international business from University of Iceland, a master's degree in economics from the University of North Carolina. He's authored a number of books on international business, knowledge networks, and salmon. Um, he's also been CEO of Iceland Chamber of Commerce, a deputy director at the Nordic Investment Bank in Finland. Again, we're so fortunate to have him share information with us. Please help me join, or please join me in welcoming Thor to the stage. Dear friends, thanks for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, Brian was enthusiastic enough to uh, challenge me to uh, visit you here in, in Alaska. It looked as a long trip for me, but in a way we went over the North Pole nearly, so it wasn't that long of a flight, a little more than seven hours. It was fairly uh, easy. I was supposed to be having a system here, wouldn't I? Oh, there it is. So is it the right button here? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, let me now turn to uh, the ocean cluster, the Iceland Ocean Cluster, and how, how we've, uh, we've built it. I always keep with me this bag, which sounds like I'm a, like a salesman, uh, which is quite OK. I must tell you, though, that one thing that I'm carrying with me is a, always a cod hat. And last year, I was, well, I was going to Norway with this. And then it was fairly fresh, and I had it in. It, I only had hand luggage with me, so it was st sitting up there in the in the in, on the plane. And I realized some people were saying, "What the heck is the smell here?" And I was really doing poker face there. I didn't show any signs of having this up there, and it worked. But uh, it's much much better now. But I'll I'll tell you the story behind it a little later. Basically, a little bit about the, the cluster to begin with. It is established in 2011 as a networking company uh, as a result of a research at the University of Iceland. And did we do this too fast? Now we, now we have 60 companies uh, as members. Uh, these uh, companies are with a turnover of, of, of around 6 billion US dollars. These, these numbers really don't tell anything. I mean, we have, uh, but at least it indicates that this, for a very small society of Iceland, this is a significant part of our economy. I will come back to that a little later. I had to pay, put this picture up, actually, because this actually represents what most Icelanders will recognize as the Alaskan, being the Alaskan lupine, the plant which is all around Iceland. I absolutely love this plant. Some environmentalists are getting bothered by it but, uh, because it's very strong. But it has actually changed the uh, landscape a bit. Where we had sands, now there is the Alaskan lupine. So um, it's really a, a blossoming, blossoming time now in Iceland. And I think it's uh, a worthy and, and a beautiful representative of, of the Alaska. It was actually imported from Alaska in the 50s. So we, I, they wanted to tell, wanted to sort of let me breathe a little bit about the form of the cluster. 
this is basically, as I, as I mentioned, a private company. It's owned by me, the management company of the cluster. Um, it is uh, initiated at the University of Iceland, where I was wrapping up my PhD, which I actually began in 2002. Um, and what it, it all began by, the, by my research into the relationships of international entrepreneurs. And what became interesting when I was studying is that, that I, was, I was talking to software engineers from different sectors, and I wasn't really thinking about the sectors themselves. I was just thinking about trying to get a widespread uh, group of uh, software engineers and to, to talk to them. And what, but what came out of it, which was quite interesting, is it seemed as the, the industry, the, the people coming from the fishing industry or the seafood industry, often ocean technology people, people that have been in the forefront in developing interesting technology for processing and, and fisheries in general, they had a much smaller network, much smaller relationship networks. And I thought, to begin with, this was something that could just be coincident. So I actually invited 20 CEOs of these small companies. Can you imagine we have 60 small companies in Iceland on this small island of ours that are all exporting branded products in fisheries technology? It's quite good. But the fact is many of them are really small. So we invited them, to, 20 of them together to a, to a a meeting room in Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland. And what was interesting for me is that we're still, let's set the stage, 20 CEOs of small tech companies all servicing the local and the global fishing industry. With a population of 300,000, they began introducing themselves. They did not, they knew about each other maybe, but they, had, they were not in any relationships. They were not competing. One is in chilling, or two are in chilling, three are in lines, you know, cutting. There are all kinds of surveillance equipment, etc. But they had never done that. I, I was sometimes wondered, I've sometimes wondered whether the small society even, even sort of a burden in that sense, because when I was getting deeper into it and asking those people why, what kind of relationships do you have? And why are you not talking more to others, etc.? They also said, I remember specifically one guy who said, Thor, if I know everybody in Iceland. I could call whomever I like tomorrow. All the big CEOs I can call upon, or I can call some of the uh, CEOs of the other tech companies. And my question then was, have you done any of that for the last 12, 18 months? I've had no reason to do that. So basically, we have like a, a phony safety network somehow, uh, because obviously ideas are not uh, are, are not shared if people are not talking. So we, in the small society, have have in that sense had this problem of of creating a somewhat a silos of businesses that we have seen since great potentials in building further relationships. Among. So, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, just to give you an idea, all the companies in the cluster pay a fee to us. Uh, this fee is maybe around uh, from a couple of thousand dollars up to eight to ten thousand dollars per per year. So it's not significant for the for the large companies, but it means also dedication, which I think is really the key here. We do not have any government institutions within the cluster, and I, I'm, we're planning to do that. But I didn't want us often with the European, Europeans at least, is that sometimes I feel that we built a system which is a welfare system for companies. They don't have to do anything themselves anymore. They just sit there and complain about government, uh, complain about red taping, but the first meetings that I had were, were actually of that type as well. The businesses were sitting there and saying, Thor, you're doing some mistake here. And I said, what is it? Where are the representatives from government, Thor? They need to be here because this is, has all to do with government. 
The fact is, I've been in, in various businesses and various associations, and they are doing a great job. But the fact is also, it is very important for businesses to talk to each other and try to figure out a way to get more involved, try to figure out a way to create jobs, to create new ideas, and figure out a way to maybe sort those projects that are within their reach and projects that lie out of their reach. And we have lots of industry associations and others that can deal with that. I don't look upon that as my task to be lobbying. My task is only dating service for businesses. I'm probably the, the greatest dating service agent in Iceland, <laughs> and I'm, I'm proud of it. I think it's really important to have a clear mission in that respect. So let's, uh, the mission for the uh, Iceland Ocean Cluster is basically to double the value of the, the cluster in the next 10 years. And we basically think it is uh, something that we can uh, do. It will take some efforts. It will take some paradigm shifts. And that's probably a part of what uh, is my message here today, that there is a need for a paradigm shift in this industry. And uh, I think in many ways, I will also indicate that our countries, like Alaska and Iceland, are perfect candidates for such paradigm shifts, and I'll tell you why. I'm, sh I'm splitting it up in three. We're first sort of setting the stage, comparing a little bit Iceland and Alaska seafood. Secondly, we'll go more into the Iceland Ocean Cluster concept and how it, how it has been built. And thirdly, we'll look into the opportunities in the seafood industry. So just to give you an idea, in the beginning, to compare Alaska and Iceland, we did our homework. It's really complicated, though. There are so many data out, out there from Alaska. It's much easier for Iceland as we have only one economic statistics institute, so we can go there. But we actually had to do a lot of our own work in Iceland, though, to get uh, somewhat clarified the, the numbers that we had for the ocean cluster. But just to give you an idea, this is the, the picture that is often depicted, and you've probably seen it. You will see Iceland there. You will see the World Cats 2011, where Alaska is obviously impressively high up there, and Iceland as well. But I want to make note of one thing that I think we have, we have not seen clear enough. The fact is that all around us in this picture are countries that are developing countries. So in many ways, if we would be dreaming, if, if we would be considering those countries that might actually become what I call the sort of the Silicon Valley of fish, I guess we might actually have an opportunity there. Not to say that many of these large countries do not have a great opportunity, but we have some advantages of being developed countries with sustainable resources, traceable resources, natural resources that we can do much better with. But there's a need for a paradigm shift that I'm going to be addressing a little later on. If we look at the harvest by species, species you will find a significant difference there. But at the same time, you will see that uh, we both have whitefish. We Icelanders have Pollock. Uh, Alaskans have Pollock. We do not have any uh, wild salmon. We envy you for that, because obviously the prices for the salmon is absolutely great. But the cod has always been our life. And we're kind of proud of being, being a cod nation, in a sense. And probably one of the things that has helped us Icelanders also to create, uh, I can say with fairly high certainty, one of the best fisheries in the world, is that we have not, not that many options. We did not have these options in the past. We could not make this a regional problem. We could not make this in an industry that was more or less supported by government, because this was such a huge industry that if it were, then basically the, the whole economy would be bankrupt. So we had to make business out of this resource, and we've done extremely well in that in, in the country, uh, even though we believe strongly that we can do much, much better. If we look at some of the comparisons we have tried to make. We see the operating revenues being 2.2 billion in, in Iceland from, from fisheries, 3.6 in Alaska, 
The total contribution is quite interesting, and I'm, 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 it may be obviously a calculation uh, issue here, but the total con contribution for Iceland is calculated uh, around 7 billion, but around 5.8. And I should note here that we're talking about the total contribution to the economy. And we have obviously a large technology sector, for instance, that has been developed through the fisheries and fish processing. We have a large uh, uh, marketing and sales organizations that are, that are selling also fish from other countries. We have a, a, a huge logistics business that is selling fish from all over the world. Uh, so, and we're trying to calculate that into that, that picture to give us the, uh, an indication of where we basically stand. We have also subsidiaries. We have around 150 subsidiaries outside of Iceland dealing with fisheries, aquaculture, or fish processing. So we are, in that sense, uh, we're not calculating that all into that picture, but it gives an indication where, where, we're, where we're heading. If we look at the harvest, 1.3 billion million tons uh, versus 2.5 million in, the, in, in Alaska. X vessel value 1.3, 1.9. What's very interesting is tons per worker. We still see in our numbers a huge difference in terms of the efficiency in these two sectors. It has changed, the, these are numbers from 2011, and this has changed significantly, obviously, in Alaska in, in recent years. But what we're also seeing is that these are the numbers that we came up with when we are comparing the COD. Uh, exports from Alaska and Iceland. We have 100,000 tons in Iceland. We have around 80,000 tons in Alaska. We have the export value being 690 million in Iceland, 250 million in Alaska. And what's interesting here is that nearly a quarter of the export value of the cod now is, is our products that we threw into the dustbin some 20 years ago. So a huge added value in our uh, fisheries is coming from utilizing more of the fish. And I'll go more into that. So we've never done that as a necessarily a social responsibility. We've just done it as a business. And through that, we've been able to create an interesting Omega business, all kinds of other industries that, we'll, well, that I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about later on. Looking at the, the efficiency gains that we've seen in the, in, the, in the caught business, we were catching 460,000 uh, metric tons in 81, but in 2011, 180,000 tons. Very sustainable business, but like everywhere else, uh, much less cats than in, in previous years. If we look at the export value, this, this is current value. We're seeing 340 million in 81, 680 million in, in 2011. What this basically means is that we've been able to much more than double the value of each cod caught in the Icelandic waters in the last 30 years. And this shows us the great opportunities that we have to, to appreciate each fish. And we might actually, both these nations, be a little bit resource blinded. We're always talking about these millions of tons. I've been beginning now, because we in Iceland are always talking about these 200,000 tons of cod. I've begun telling sort of my people that this, these are 65 million cods. And let's treat each fish as it is deserved to be treated, with the, which, which is res, with respect and with the idea of doing more with it than we've done before. We have natural product, we have a traceable product, and we have a sustainable product. And let's figure out some other products that have these qualities in the world. In a world which is in need of proteins more than anything else, the comparisons or the, competi the competitive products that were, or the, co the, the products that we're competing with are farmed animals. So we have an absolute advantage there that we need to make sure we are, we are uh, utilizing. Just a little bit about the Icelandic fleets. You see how it has come down significantly, but we still have 
number of small vessels. Uh, we have still uh, uh, a group of, of, uh, to uh, of large vessels and trawlers, but it's con come down significantly. And if we look at the, the number of fish processing firms, always the same trends. We see the efficiency. We still have the, the, the rule in Iceland that no one fishery can own more than 7% of the quota. And this means that we still have, a, I, I believe, very efficient uh, companies. They have emerged, many of them, but they are diversifying. They, they are, they are di dispersed all around Iceland now. And they are sort of the core of the, the local communities around the island. If we look at the number of jobs in fish industry, this was basically the picture when I sort of began studying the, the, the fisheries. This was the pictures that were always being shown. These are the total number of people working in fisheries and po po total number of people working in, in processing. And what's wrong with this picture is that when I began interviewing some of the fishing vessel owners, they said that they are outsourcing a lot. I said, well, what, what do you mean? They said, well, I had some electrician working with me, but he then established a company that is working for me. But I said, he's doing the same. Yes, that's okay. But when I looked at the economic statistics, suddenly the guy previously having been defined as a worker within fisheries was now defined as a worker in services. So all the people around Iceland were saying, well, I, I like your how you are appreciating fisheries, Thor, but the fact is it's playing smaller and smaller role in the economy, given the numbers from the national statistics. Absolutely silly. If something, it's, it's grown. But to summarize, from the past, we have the canneries, Alaska, drying in, in Iceland, salteries, and then later fro frozen products. Today, we're focusing both nations on, on more fresh, we're focusing in the past, seeing logistical problems and challenges. We're seeing logistical solutions, many of them. One which we were really pleased with is obviously the direct flights between Iceland and, and Alaska. The overcapitalization of stocks in the past, the sustainable fisheries management models we're, we're both proudly presenting in, a, in the global market. So we're saying seafood in Alaska and Iceland is clean, fresh, traceable, natural, sustainable, and responsible. And we should indicate that we have a lot of opportunities to further develop our industry. So let me talk you into a little bit about the, uh, the IOC concept, what we call to increase value in the ocean cluster by connecting people and businesses. This is the picture that I showed you before. This is basically fisheries and fish processing. And it's very hard to begin to establish a cluster in an environment which really has flawed statistics and is also indicating all the time that this is a dying, oh, they, people are saying, well, I'm proud of our fishermen, but they are getting fewer and fewer. So we're not getting into that business really. We're just going to do something completely different, a little more modern into new, new eras, areas. But when we did our study, we found a completely different picture. We found obviously a lot of services, a lot of companies that were obviously still within the industry, that when we defined the whole ocean cluster, all those that were involved with the, the, uh, the industry, directly or indirectly, we found that there are at least 25,000 jobs rather than the 9,000 that we have still within the economic statistics indications. But at the same time, we see huge opportunities. So huge opportunities that it would be silly of a nation that is proud of its uh, fisheries not to harvest on them and work with them and try to figure out a way to strengthen our, what we do best uh, and do better with it even. So that's how the Iceland Ocean Cluster came to be. And within the cluster, we have these, uh, what I call just the bubbles. We began by mapping each and every sector within the Iceland Ocean Cluster. Uh, we found out through that mapping that we had obviously a very strong fisheries and fish processing, but we, we also had a huge uh, industry, which is ocean technology. 
we had a huge industry in marketing and, and sales and a very strong industry or, or services in the log logistics uh, in Iceland. We had also a new breed of biotech companies. And what, I was, what is the most fascinating part in the beginning for me is that we were already realizing that there were few interesting biotech companies in Iceland doing fish products. And when I say biotech, sometimes for all of us, it's like, wow, where, what kind of rocket science is that? So let's, go, let's get down to it. Let's keep it in the picture. But the fact is we're talking about just companies that are trying to do something more with the, these byproducts. They may be doing beauty products. They may be doing nutraceuticals, maybe some of them pharmaceuticals. So I, I thought to myself, well, why not hook them up with the fishermen? with the CEOs of some of the largest fisheries and see what happens. Because I found out that many of the fisheries were not really involved in, in any of the biotechs or any of the full pro pro processing of, of these products. So we arranged a meeting, which was quite tough. You know that those that are trying to arrange meetings with clusters, it's really tough. So we even what we did uh, is that we arranged the meeting very close to some of the leading fisheries. So that's how we got uh, three CEOs of some of the largest fisheries in Iceland. When I say CEOs of large fisheries, I mean really successful uh, companies with uh, good operating profits and uh, sort of the pride of, of their uh, local communities. So uh, at these meetings, we got 10, 12, I should say, young uh, entrepreneurs introducing their ideas. Some of them had been working quite a long, for a very long time on their uh, projects and products. And it was after that meeting, one CEO of the, of, of the fishery said, uh, I, this, is, this is the wow effect. I, I had no idea. And I was saying, well, they've been in, some of these guys have been researching the enzymes from cod for nearly 15 years, and you didn't know. I had no idea. He was honest enough. So the next question was, what should we do? And he said, let's invite them to, invite them to my office. And there was a meeting held at his office a, a week later. And it was marvelous to meet the biotech people after that meeting. They've been working on the, these products for maybe 15, 10, 15 years, some of them. And they said, we've never been into an office of a CEO of a fishing company. And I was saying, what kind of... What kind of business are we doing? We are sitting all at these tables, at all these conferences, talking about how bad government is, when we just need to plug you. We just need to basically plug these people. And that's what we did. And what came out of it is uh, a company now that we are very proud of, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about later on. But the fact is, at least, this is such an easy stuff. Being the dating service of the businesses in Iceland is much easier than I thought. Because pe people are just, when they begin talking, they absolutely love it. They love the idea that they are just a little shy, that's the Islander per, uh, in a way, that they are not really for approaching everybody and saying, I've got an idea, you know, I'm great, etc. So if, if there's someone, some kind of a meteor to them between, the magic happens. But what's the key to the success of the cluster, therefore, and cluster in general? That's the stories that I'm telling you also. Successful stories about relationships building. If we have that, then we've done our job. That's the only thing we should be focusing on, at least at the initial stages of the cluster. This is basically the cluster picture that I've been following very closely. And I'm not sure if you're able to read any of it. Wasn't it typical to have a picture that no, one's, no, one, no one can read? <laughs> but at least what it, it's basically doing, this is a, a model from I4 Williams, which is one of the sort of key, my key mentors in, in clustering. It actually, we're just following very closely absolute, uh, absolutely this model. It begins with an introduction. In the, in the initial part, you need to be sure to to introduce the relevance. You go into the analysis, which is part three. You have to form the leadership group, and these need to be absolutely key business people in the economy, the local economy or whatever. You can't, cannot get away with that. 
you need to have them with you. If they are not there, don't try it. And I mean it seriously. It would be ridiculous to try to establish a cluster without leaders in the business community being a part of it. And let's face it, they are all interested. We just need to make sure that they understand that a cluster is not just another club. Some of the people that I approached in the beginning thought that I was just establishing a new club. A new club, and one guy said to me, Thor, are you then going to send me a newsletter? And I said, I promise you, you will never, ever, never, ever receive a newsletter from me. I have nothing against newsletters, but I just think it's very important to make a point there. And, and the other thing, what are you doing to doing for me, Thor? I'm just a dating service. That doesn't sound a lot. Well, let's try it. But the fact is, we have, we, the, there's really a, a company now calling up and saying uh, we want to quit uh, in, in our collaboration. There are much more opportunities that companies are seeing than the, so. But to go on with this, the introduction of the relevance was really important. I think in many ways we should not shy away from the fact that that is really what we need to do in the beginning. And what we did in the beginning with the initial analysis and introducing the relevance was basically to go into a very detailed study about the economic relevance of the ocean sector in Iceland. And this picture presents a very important part. We received information from all the largest fisheries in Iceland regarding all their purchases of goods and services from different parts of the economy. Very complicated study, but we wanted to do it. And through that, we have the light and the dark, the light part around the fisheries being the categories within economic statistics that are really the key uh, services to fisheries. According to uh, this, the, the, the study we did, the blue would be uh, services that are less but important as well. But what happens in a cluster, and I had nothing to do this, with this. This had all happened before me. So that's why don't misunderstand me when I'm saying we have had clustering for years in Iceland. It's been really successful. We just can do much better uh, than this. But what has happened with uh, this industry is, this, is that suddenly, because the fisheries, somehow the mentality of the fishermen in Iceland has always been, we want to be in the forefront. We want to have absolutely the best technology and the best product. I have no idea why this is the case, but it is the case. Probably because these people have always, always been fairly, uh, most of the time, been fairly successful in, in business and understood that part of it is quality product for the European and the US market. So suddenly, these companies that have been servicing the fishing industry realize that they have the world-class product to go then abroad. So they begin their own exports. But what happens as well, which is, I believe, fascinating, so you will find technology doing own exports now. What happens then is the, the technology companies that are now are around 65 exporting technology form, firms in Iceland, some of them basically in their garage, but with a brand and selling, they suddenly see a new breed of companies servicing them. That's the beauty of a cluster. And I wasn't there when this all happens, happened. So it's basically always occurring. What we can do in clusters is to try to encourage people to do more of this, because we know this works. So that's basically what we've done. So what we had in the end, we at least saw the Iceland statistic indicating the size of fisheries and processing being 9% of GDP. Our research indicates that the ocean cluster to be over 26% of GDP. And it, it was a paradigm shift for us. It really made a huge difference. And no academic has stood up and said, Thor, you've done it wrong. You've done the calculation wrong. So it's really important for us also, those countries that are relying on these very valuable resources and, and important industries to, to not only calculate, but also tell the media to make sure that the media is in on it as well with us. So we have also done now sort of our, our estimates for the growth of the cluster from 2010 to 2025. And see, if you look at fisheries, the basic fisheries, we're not seeing a huge growth in that. 
we're seeing that as an important, hugely important uh, sort of ground for the the building of the the growth of the of the ocean cluster. But everything that is going to be happening within the ocean cluster is a spin-off from that. So we're not going to be catching more fish. We are doing more with each fish. We're doing more with the byproducts of the fish. And that, that is shown here. We're seeing the aquaculture uh, increasing significantly in Iceland. We're seeing the high tech doing a lot also. We're seeing uh, the management and consulting part. We are very careful with ocean tourism. I haven't done any detailed studies on that, but we are, we're adding it in as a, as a part of a very important uh, economic picture. This, I, I was trying to leave it out, but I thought being uh, after Brian did his, I needed to show that I can do it as well. <laughs> so, but basically what it says, and, and it's really important that also for my, my fishermen to realize is that we see fisheries being the low growth and a bit traditional tech. And they understand it. They, they know they are obviously in Iceland. If someone is high tech on board ships, that would be Icelandic ships and high tech in processing. But still, there is not a room for a lot of growth uh, in, in, in similar manner as in other areas like in the Omega, where we're trying to move up to the pharmaceutical level with the the liver of the wild fish, for instance, and the marine biotech, etc. So it's very important to map it. That's what we're trying to do, to make sure that people realize the opportunities. And it is not enough only to talk about it. It needs to be detailed research behind it. And that is, in, in my view, the key uh, to a success of a cluster, that you've done the mapping right, you've done the analysis right. So. Now I, I move to the most uh, exciting part of, of my presentation, which basically are the opportunities. And people in Iceland sometimes think that I'm a little too optimistic. I, uh, every th th third word comes out of me opportunities. But I definitely think there are short, huge opportunities in this industry that we should do more with it than we've, we've done in the past. And I'll, I'll go through that a little bit now. What I'm saying is that We have been emphasizing stepping stones. We've been emphasizing what we call the short-term tactical uh, agenda. And these are low-hanging fruits. And we're always running into the, the, the problem with trying to get companies to collaborate is that they come to the first meetings, as I mentioned previously, with, a skept with skepticism. They have no idea what you're doing. And me now, you know, people also think that we're always trying to get them into research and development, that they are sort of like, ooh, I'm, uh, I'm not there really. I'm just hands-on guy doing my business. But when studying what these people are doing often, they are absolutely into R&D. They've just never perceived themselves as being R&D. But these are people in processing that are continuously, just as I had interviews with fantastic processing companies here in, in, in uh, in this town, in Alaska. They are not all from here. I think some of the companies that I've been speaking to are also from Anchorage. But, uh, but what's, what's, what's absolutely great is that the, the companies that I met, met here were really into development. And I was very impressed with that. I thought they could talk more together, but they haven't that much, it seems. But they can at least do much more than we we uh, thought. So we are looking at the short-term tactical agenda, the stepping stones, and let me go through some of the bubbles here now. So we have the Iceland Ocean Cluster working with different types of uh, clusters, clusters within a cluster. And let's look at the first bubble here, which is the R&D education and training. And I'm fascinated with the R&D and a uh, cluster that has been initiated here. I've always been skeptical about clusters that have, do not have a specific mission, but I liked very much the introduction to, to the cluster and the idea to say, well, research is fun. We can do research in different areas. This is business as everything else. And I think you're on the right track with that. I'm very, very impressed with, with that 
starting point. But the R&D education is really, in Iceland, we've had all these institutions working with, with us. Um, one bank actually came into it, but mostly these are all the research and the, uh, the universities within Iceland, within, within Iceland that are doing work in the field of education and training mainly, but also R&D. And we have some projects that have been really successful. And one thing that I, I uh, challenge you to look at, which is called project sharing. This was the idea that the research institute, mainly the universities as well, wanted to do was to try to connect students with companies. We're seeing so many students having difficulties in finding out the projects they can be working on as a final, final project at school. So what we try to do there is to, to, through the internet, try to hook them up. And this has been really successful. We have quite many successful stories now to tell about students that have found projects within, within the industry and have become enthusiastic about the industry through that work. Uh, what we have also been trying to depict are the people in the industry, within, within the industry, in the project sharing concept. What I'm saying is that we're just showing young people that there are more, there's more to it than basically only fisheries and processing. There are people working in, in uh, marketing in some of the largest ocean technology companies. There are people into biotech and, and other areas. Uh, we've also done a collaboration with schools and commercial sector to present the ocean cluster in primary schools. I've got some of the products with me that I'm going to show you later on. But it's amazing to let kids handle some of these products. One product I have that I, the kids like is, is the fish skin. This is basically thrown out, th thrown into the dustbin in most countries. But in Iceland, we are taking nearly 170,000 skins like these and sell them in a, in a global market for fashion. And this is $750 per piece. Pretty good business. And, you know, when the kids come, they, they tend to begin to uh, fiddle with it and say, I ha we had no idea. We are getting quite interesting questions also on the fisheries island, I must tell you. One question came from a student. He raised his hand and said, tell me one thing. Do we also catch pregnant fish? We sat there very seriously, wondered how to respond to that pregnancy testing of fish before we catch it. But uh, we realized still that there is, there is still work to do within, within Iceland to try to make sure that uh, our youngsters are following what we are doing. Etc. So we have also had summer schools in Iceland where we're teaching young people or telling them about these projects. We're paying them a little bit, but they are at least doing something in the summertime to uh, get to know the fishing industry and the new, new ideas that we have uh, within the industry. One of the greatest things we did last summer is we hired 15 university, grad, university students to work with us on different projects. And you can imagine, I'm always telling this, you know, 15 students in Iceland, hiring them is like hiring 15,000 students in the US. <laughs> so suddenly we real realized that many families all around knew about the new ideas, the new products coming out. Let's do more of that for both of us. This is something that is the key to the success of the industry to get the new generation in. They are not only good when the new generation takes over, they may also influence us. They come up with new ideas regarding marketing, designing, web, etc., etc. So we've, uh, he, he's saved. The guy who's there is actually studying engineering in Stockholm now. He's completely okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this was like day two. I, I'm glad that I was not supposed to be on this picture, but uh, I would be more worried. So w one of the greatest things that we're seeing now also, and completely different from most other countries, is that if we look at the admissions to fishery schools and, in, and, and universities in Iceland that are focusing on, on food or fisheries, you will find uh, a rising interest in the industry among students. Obviously, it's partly because the business has been doing really well, but it's also partly because of the collaboration between the universities to, treat, to create more excitement. And we need to spend more time 
telling our stories. It's really the key to the success of, of, of our, our industry is to tell these stories, tell, the, tell people about the opportunities that we have. 2013 is coming up. It's even better. And we are just amazed with it. But I must also tell you what has been one of the best moments of, of mine for the last three years, ever since establishing the cluster, was last summer. Then came uh, a, a student to me and told me that she was going to uh, uh, a, a fishery school in Iceland. And I said, it's great. Why are you coming to me? And she said, well, uh, the cluster has been talking so much about these new products. Uh, so I, I want to do that. I want to do marketing of byproducts. I want to do maybe designing of byproducts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Later on, a, a CEO of a fishing vessel company called me up and said, "Well, I must tell you, this is a, a relative of mine." And she had always said that she had no interest in doing the the basic stuff that we're doing, but we were really pleased with the fact that she is going this track now, due to the fact that we're trying to show a little different picture of the whole industry. So these are the best moments of a, of a cluster management, where you see a new generation being brought into the industry or coming into the industry without, uh, for me to do nothing else but to introduce the, the, the possibilities in, in the industry. If we look at ocean technology, we have also, this has been one of the toughest group it was in the beginning. I, I can say that officially they know it, these guys, because they, in the beginning when we met, they, that was the handshake that I took, told you about. They didn't know each other. But after one of the first meetings, a guy came to me and said, Thor, I can't come again. And I said, why is that? There was a guy there that stole my patent some 15 years ago. And I said, 15 years? Wow. How about forgiveness or, you know? <laughs> because both of them were basically running operations in their garages. These were not huge companies, but uh, so these were all kinds of interesting uh, development within this group. But what has been one of the, one, another great moment for, for me is that these companies all are now collaborating on different projects. And one of the most interesting projects is, is what we call green marine technology. What we did in the summer 2012 was to take detailed interviews with all the entrepreneurs within the group. And so we visited all the companies, took the interviews, and we analyzed what came out of these interviews. And what was interesting is that they were all somewhere in these interviews bragging a little bit about their green technology. The problem with the word green technology is that fisheries tend to look at it as a green piece thing, and Greenpeace has, green has always had sort of a mixed relationship structure with, with fisheries. They are doing a great job in many ways. But, uh, so they were not bragging about it that much, but they said, well, basically, my technology is in the forefront in the world. This was a technology maybe with trawl doors that are steered, that where a skipper can tell their, his, his, his trawl doors, don't touch the seabed. Or there's a, there's a, a, a system chilling, uh, chilling fish on board ships, which doesn't use oil, but uses uh, ammonia, etc. All these products. And we have now presented this here, but this was basically a low-hanging fruit also, because I was not with a group there that I could say, let's, okay, I'm, I'm leaving the meeting now, you'll just do some R&D together. That's just not how it functions. It takes a long time to build the trust, so that was basically where we, we needed to do something that was low-hanging fruit. A simple marketing program did it. And what was interesting is that the international media is, is grabbing it. They are talking about it. They are, when I say international media, I mean the fishing industry media. They are talking about these initiatives. They are talking about these uh, collaboration between companies. And one of the, this is basically, if you would go into the website, greenmarinetechnology.is, you will find a, an interactive website with a small town where you can then touch the button and, and go and play with it a little bit. Uh, the, the companies are, some of them doing fish technology, uh, fisheries technology, I should say. Some of them are doing uh, processing technology, et cetera, et cetera. This is, I, I took this picture myself. No one understands this but, but myself how important it is. 
This is the first time when the group, part of the group, sat down with a, with a drawing of a ship. That is what we call now R&D. They were all with inputs. Some of them were really good in chilling fish. Some of them are some of the best in the world in, in fish processing machinery on board. Uh, some of them are doing other types of, of, of equipment for uh, fish gear, etc. So they were just combining themselves, combining efforts to make sure that they could maybe present a whole package, which would what we would call the greenest fishing ship uh, in the world. And it takes time. But for a cluster manager to have a group there of ocean tech guys sitting together discussing this, that is a part of what I call a possible success for a cluster. That's how we should try to work, always try to get them together, not pressure them into uh, doing the R&D to begin with, because all the clusters, uh, even the, these fine super clusters are doing all that. We just need to be with people that are really hands-on working on projects and hoping that we will soon, in maybe one or two or three years, develop into more of a trusted relationship, more R&D, et cetera. So that's basically uh, the story. I had one, one part which is very important. This is fisheries and fish processing. This was a tough group. This is always a tough group, but it's really a challenge. We have a, a nice group of people now with us. Some of the largest fisheries in Iceland are with us in this group. And what we've begun here is basically to try to map all the, all the players. This is only the Reykjanes Peninsula. I'm glad I'm not comparing it with Alaska in terms of size, but this is at least a peninsula where the Keflavik airport is, etc. So we began really mapping exactly where are these companies. And we realized after the interviews with many of these companies that they had obviously never spoken together either. So the guy who's doing the liver was not necessarily the guy who's doing rows, for instance. He had never talked to the guys who were doing dried heads, etc. So there is clearly there came the opportunity. It always comes with the showing with, with the analysis of the mapping of the, the industries. So another thing that was really important for the for the fishing and fish processing is sort of a to change the uh, the the atmosphere. So at one of this one of these meetings, we got one of the most famous gourmet chefs in Iceland as a surprise first time ever in Iceland history coming with the Icelandic cod into the podium. And we were proudly saying, well, what the heck? This is the guy that we've been living on for years. Why shouldn't he be presented in the podium? So he was, he was there. He began cutting it up, and he was showing the intestines and some of the products that we could do with the cod. So that was, one, once again, a little bit... Uh, a way for us to try to get the media interested, media involved, with uh, trying to get into the industry people that are not typical proponents of the industry, people, people that are coming from different angles. And this was actually a, a, an important part of the, the initial parts of, the, uh, of the, uh, the industry. This is then the Bible of the whole uh, cluster, I would say, in terms of the fishing and fisheries uh, fisheries and fish processing uh, industry. What we're saying here is that basically the traditional fishing industry is basically fish meal, animal feed, and food. Both of our nations have been, are becoming world class in that, sustainable, traceable, and all that. But the fact is for Iceland, for instance, we have in the fish series high paying jobs really high. These are the highest paid jobs in Iceland. But they are becoming fewer and fewer, those that are on board the vessels. On land, fish processing, basic fish processing, fish meal processing, these are uh, tend to be jobs that Icelanders are not accepting. So we are importing people to do that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just sad to see an industry that if it doesn't go any further, is going to be stuck in uh, without and uh, not showing the young generations an opportunity to do anymore. So that's why we're moving up the ladder. 
We're looking into the functional foods, cosmetics, health food, and pharma. And I'll show you some interesting uh, calculations here in terms, of the, in terms of the numbers that we're dealing with. This is one thing that we're really is extremely important as well. This is showing how much of each white fish, mainly caught, is utilized by different nations according to our studies. And this is telling us that Iceland is in the forefront here. We're actually moving up to 80% in the next, I think, in the next couple of years, meaning that we're using out of the white fish, we're using 80%. 20% is still thrown, mainly because of freezing trawlers. If we go to our neighboring countries, they are on average less than around 50%. So there's a, there's a huge potential. And this number, 450,000 tons, is only what's thrown into the sea or into the dustbin from cod fisheries in the Barents Sea region. Can you imagine the numbers here and the opportunities that we have to do more with, with uh, these products? I wanted also to mention part of the fishing and fish processing. We've had meetings with the plant managers, which I think for the ocean product uh, cluster is very important. Not only focus on the CEOs, focus on the, the plant managers. We've had three spin-off companies that we have established within the, the fishing and fish processing part of the cluster. And what we do in Iceland within the cluster is to initiate projects that lead to real companies. And I think it's really important to try to, if possible, to get more, more of the cluster companies to be involved with putting their money on the table, establishing a company, going all the way. Because po companies know that. Companies are not really good at project sharing in projects often. They can do that, but this is what we've done. So we have a company now called uh, Renovo, which is a refresh center, which is now uh, with people in processing, planning to initiate a, a more quality into the refreshed market. Another company that we have is called Ocean Excellence. This is a fantastic project. We have here companies within the cluster that are coming from different parts. We have an engineering company, ocean technology company specialized in dry, dry technology. We have a company that is uh, also uh, specialized in engineering, the largest engineering company in Iceland, I was mentioning that. Uh, so there's a bunch of companies that own shares in this company, and what this company has already done is to, is to uh, set up a website. They've already done a, uh, a, signed an agreement with Dubai to dry uh, or to advise on the drying of anchovies and uh, sardines. So, uh, and this is one of the most important part of the cluster work. This is what has happened since. We're now coming up with a solution that is allowing small local communities to uh, dry products fa fairly efficiently without having to invest in huge plants. So this is a container solution for drying uh, food. The beauty here is that, that we are not necessarily saying that we're only doing fish. We might be doing uh, meat or even, even fruits, but drying is something that we have a long tradition, more longer tradition than most in terms of both electric, uh, electricity and geothermal power. So we're very pleased with, with that. We're also in, within that uh, cluster working on seeing what we can do with shrimp, shrimp byproducts. These might be all types of shells. Uh, this has been, and we have now two companies in Iceland that are getting one is already up to a pharmaceutical level with only the rest raw material from, from shells, shellfish. And this is the largest biotech company within the ocean cluster in Iceland now. That is doing shellfish. And we basically need more shells. We're looking into, we're talking now to both Canada and actually to Maine, New England about the possibility of importing shells. Five minutes, does that mean? Brilliant. Wow, I'm so sorry. It's so ex I'll, I'll just go briefly through it. Cotland, that's the third spin-off. This is the company that is really, uh, I think, has the greatest potential. This is the company that is going to do all the byproducts. That is going to be playing with doing fish oil from, turning, from the waste 
doing uh, calcium from the bones and all that. We're, we're, we're te teasing our European friends by saying the European cats is around $15 per, per cod. If we look at the Icelandic cats, that would be around $20. We are having a significant difference in terms of the value of each cod just by utilizing more parts of it and going very fast through it. These are the products that are in these bags. I've shown you the, the famous fish head, skin, and another product that I'm really proud of also for, on, on behalf of the, 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 the university people are these enzymes. These are enzymes from the cod sold as a beauty product. And they are really selling well. So these are part of the products, the products that we have. What's interesting is that, see, see the number that we're estimating? We can go up to $80 per piece of the cod, and this might actually be the Pollock as well. I should remind you that we are already selling Pollock heads for $3.90 per kilogram of dried Pollock heads, which is quite good. I mean, it's thrown away mostly so in, in, in this area, so there is an opportunity, opportunity here. If we look at the cod liver, just to give you an idea, this is very important. Just one minute, Brian. <laughs> this is very important. This is cod liver sold direct as cod liver. Do you see what stands here? It says $3 per pound. Now we're going up the, the value chain, as I call it. Let's see what happens. If we're able to can it, we're get, getting up to $7 per pound for the same liver. This is brutto, obviously, but it's still, we're doing, we're doing better. Instead of doing it raw, we're, we're suddenly canning it and it's up to $7. If we take the raw fish oil and sell it as an oil, we're up to $9 per pound. We're doing quite well still. If we are able to take it as a liquid liver oil, not mass, but in bottles, we're up to $24 per pound of the liver. We're, talk we're talking about the liver itself being the core of the, the, these products. If we go further with this, as we've done in Iceland, changing it into fish oil capsules, like you've done with the salmon capsules, uh, salmon oil, we're up to nearly $370 per pound of the liver. If we look at the intestines, if, in, as in most cases, if it's thrown into the dustbin, Obviously, this is no value. And we're re really having difficulty getting many fisheries to understand there is value in, in, the, in this dust, uh, dustbin culture. If we do the animal feed, we're up to $2 per pound. If we go into the intestines used for beauty products, we're up to $300 per pound. If we're out doing fish skin in the, uh, uh, as, as, as a way of medical device, it's, this is wrong, sorry, this should not be. This is where we are. This is the collagen. If we sell bulk, the fish skin now, we're up to $7 per pound. This is actually, you can see it, this is white. This is really white pow powder. Nothing illegal about this here. <laughs> this is just my powder, but it, it looks in a sense bad, but this is absolutely beautiful product made out of fish skin. If we do it in bottles, it's up to $70 per pound. If we do some kind of foot and skin cream, it's up to $90 per pound. If we're up to doing design, like the fist leather I've shown you, we're nearly up to $120 per pound. If we do the medical device, my favorite product of all the products within the ocean cluster in Iceland, basically a plaster, we're up to numbers that are amazing. These are, these are medical devices for people that are having difficulty getting their wounds healed. So they are using basically the fish skin as instead of, of uh, some other products that are available. So these might be numbers that we were not really understanding. Icelandic cluster experience in Alaska, just briefly summarize what I say, create awareness in the community for further utilizing the natural, sustainable, and traceable protein Tell the story. Don't be shying away from telling the story. Secondly, aim at moving up the value chain. Use the cluster concept to increase collaboration among processing plants regarding quality, marketing, etc. 
Thirdly, start with local mapping of rest raw material. Find ways to start collaborating with oil production of salmon and ketin from shells, then establish further R&D by hooking up with biotech centers in the US, Iceland, or Norway. You have the largest biotechs in the world. Start calling them up. Finally, get students systematically on board to further study magnitude of rest raw material, map what other countries are doing in nutraceuticals, etc. My final conclusion is this is the way to go. Continuously work on the idea of moving up this ladder using the cluster. If you do so, you will get the young generation in, which is the key to the success of, of this industry of ours. Sorry for the delay. Thank you. We're actually able to take a couple questions. If we, there's a microphone in the middle there. If somebody wants to step up now. Hello, Thor. My name is Charla Brown. I'm a professor in the School of Management here at the University of Alaska Southeast. Um, I was taking note of your chart that showed the um, bachelor's of science and master's of science, specifically in response to the ocean cluster um, success, and I'm wondering if you could describe the process that the cluster went through to partner with the university and make that happen. Because I'm assuming the university needed to respond to your findings. Yeah, good, good. I think uh, the most important part is that we didn't do a lot ourselves. It was basically a collaboration between the universities. Uh, there's also a research institute in Iceland that's called MATIS, which is in fisheries, which, which is very much involved with the university. But what we, the main emphasis of the group of all the universities was to, by collaborating, they were able to get the message across through the media much more than we had been successful before trying to do it on our own, that there was an industry out there that is growing, there are lots of opportunities there, and we need food scientists, we need engineers, we need people that are, have skills in various parts of the new fisheries, so basically, the collaboration was there. It wasn't so much with regarding the curriculum of the universities, uh, but more in terms of, of creating awareness among people uh, regarding the opportunities in the industry. Good question. Since is you, you hit a tipping point at some point where you were dragging people along, and then you came to a where there was a change in their DNA or their culture, and then all of a sudden now you're running to keep up with them. So, I mean, is that sort of true? I mean, at some point do they just start getting it and, and they start thinking like, like you do? Oh, this was absolutely a brilliant metaphor. One of my favorite authors, actually Tipping Point, the author of Tipping Point, so it's a, I actually completely agree there. I am not the owner of that, surely, but that is basically happening, I think. And one of, the, one of the key successes is that we were able to bring people in, the leaders of business are into it, and they are basically becoming the owners of the, of the concept. So they are now standing in an audience, fishermen that have always been known to be talking about fisheries, and one guy actually stood with a pill, Omega pill, and he said, I may actually become a pharmacist within 10 years. This is what we could call tipping point. These are the most important tipping point when you're, when you're taking a traditional industry, even though I'm not sure whether we should be focusing on the fishermen as being the new pharmacists. We need to get the biotech industry much more into the industry. But at the same time, it's absolutely wondrous to have leaders within industry that, that do that. One more question. Yeah. Um, I'm very impressed with your uh, value added to the waste streams. And one of our issues here in, in Alaska, and specifically Southeast Alaska, with a lot of our isolated communities and our fishing industry, is we have a massive influx of migratory species all coming in at once. And that's one of our greatest issues with our waste stream. We don't have the ability to handle that much waste. Um, how would you recommend kind of spreading out the ability for value-added waste products with, uh, with our massive influx seasonally? Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. It's a very tough, it's a challenging task. But what we're trying to do, at least, is to come up with solutions that are fairly efficient and economical. 
and they can actually be nearly, nearly set up for a, for a very uh, low budget. So as the containers regarding the drying, for instance, I was mentioning, then you have the issue of electricity, though, which might actually be a costly solution for you. But we know from Norway, for instance, where they are beginning to collect a lot of waste from many of the agricultural, from the farmed salmon, they are doing it by ships, collecting it into one place. This is very expensive, but they say the future is bright for this. So logistics play a key role here, uh, and there are solutions. But these are all issues that you're, that you're mentioning that make it uh, more complicated than in the case of the Icelandic, where we have a very stable e industry all year round fishing. Okay, thank you, Thor, thank you. very much. Thank you. Broadcast of Innovation Summit, recorded on January 29, 2014 in Juneau, Alaska, is made possible by the Juneau Economic Development Council and 360 North.